Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Gordon Brown. I'm a principal software engineer at Codeplay Software, where uh, I work on uh, heterogeneous programming models for C++. And I'm going to talk today about uh, efficient GPU programming in modern C++. So the talk should last around 50 minutes, if I've timed it right. So there should be plenty of time at the end for questions. So this talk is, is largely a continuation of a, a talk I gave uh, last year's CppCon um, that focused on the SQL programming model, the, the standard from Kronos, that allows you to program heterogeneous devices in C++, uh, specifically GPUs. So quick disclaimer before I start. This talk is, is based on the SQL programming model. Um, however, much of what I'm talking about would apply to many other programming models that you'd use for GPGPU, OpenCL, CUDA, and the like. Um, although the terminology that I'm going to be using will be specific to SQL and, and OpenCL, but so that might vary slightly with what you'd be expect you'd be used to from CUDA. So I'm going to start off. Um, talking about a little bit of motivation about why you might want to use the GPU in the first place. And then I'm going to do a, a brief introduction to SQL for those who haven't seen or aren't familiar with SQL. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the SQL programming model, so how that maps down to the GPU hardware. And then I'm going to go into how to optimize GPU programs, uh, looking at how to choose the right algorithm, how to use some basic GPU programming principles, and then I'm going to finish off covering in a little detail, some further ideas that you can use to optimize um, for GPU programs. So first off, why, why program the, the GPU? So you've probably seen this graph uh, a million times by now. This is effectively the, the end of Moore's law graph that, that shows that in, in the past, you know, you could, we could just rely on CPUs gradually getting more and more performance by just having more transistors, but that's not the case anymore. Nowadays, we're, it's effectively it's accepted that future efficiency is going to have to come from parallelism, and more than that, it's going to have to come from heterogeneous parallelism. So that's writing programs that take advantage of not just the CPU, but other heterogeneous devices, not just GPUs, but also other purpose-built processors like DSPs, FPGAs, vision processors, tensors processors. And the idea is that you know, your program might have different tasks that are well suited to specific hardware, and you can move those tasks over to those devices and get the, the, use the best hardware for the tasks and the problems you have. So this is a slide I've shown before, and it's a little out of date now, but it gets the point across quite well. This is a, a typical Intel chip. Um, this shows an Intel Core i7 7 gen. This is kind of the, the view of the die. And you can see this there on the chip, you have four CPU cores. Each of these cores supports hyper-threading. Each of these also supports 256-bit AVX2 instructions for vectorization. And also has uh, Intel HD graphics with 1,280 processing elements. Now, future Intel chips have, have more than this, um, as you'd expect. So if you were to write just regular C++ code, non-vectorized, running on a single thread, um, you, you, you're not taking advantage of the full potential of the chip. In fact, you're taking advantage of a very, very small amount of it. And obviously, operating systems will schedule different processes on different, different cores, but this is talking specifically about single process tasks where you get to use, want to use the entire chip. So one thing you can do is you can, you can vectorize, so using maybe inline assembly to do vector instructions or some other library or something OpenMP can allow you to do vectorization, take advantage of the whole core. And then you can do multi-threading using something like the C++ threading library or one of various other threading libraries that allow you to launch uh, functions to execute on different threads that will run on different cores. And that'll let you take advantage of all the CPU cores. But then you also, also you want to take advantage of the GPU as well. So heterogeneous dispatch will allow you to do this in order to take advantage of the entire chip. So you're using everything. So in the past, GPGPU, so general purpose uh, GPU programming, was a kind of niche technology. It was something that yeah, it was usually a very steep learning curve. It was quite a verbose, was quite verbose programming models. You often had to write your code in a separate language and then compile that in. 
And it was, so it was kind of something that was limited to experts in that domain, but that's, not, that's no longer the case anymore. So GPGPU has become much more accessible to every, all C++ developers because most, most programming models are now single source, so both your host and device code are in the same C++ source file and using single source. And um, yeah, and there's a, a various different programming models that, that take advantage of this. So brief introduction to Sickle for those who may not be familiar with it yet. Um, so Sickle is a single source C++ programming model that allows you to run standard C++ code on heterogeneous devices such as GPUs or other, other heterogeneous devices. And the way it works is it's built on top of OpenCL so it can run C++ code on any device that OpenCL supports. So one thing to note about Sickle is, is the, way, the way it's compiled is slightly different from the way you'd expect a typical C++ application to compile. So it has two different compilation phases. So it has a host compilation, but also device compilation. So for the device compilation, effectively, the same application and C++ template library headers are compiled, but it effectively identifies your device functions, your kernels that you want to compile, and then compiles them down to some device representation. It could be something like Spear or Spear V, or it could be right down to some vendor-specific instruction set. And then you have the host compilation, which is, can be any typical C++ compiler. We'll then compile the application as normal, but then the Sickle runtime will then load in this binary that was compiled separately by the device compiler and do just-in-time compilation if necessary to reduce it down to the, the final instruction set for the GPU, and then execute it through OpenCL. One of the other things to note about Sickle is that it, it's entirely standard C++. So there are many other programming models that allow you to do C++ for GPUs, but they all have uh, requirements for language extensions or keywords or pragmas. So Sickle doesn't have any of that, so it's entirely standard C++. So even if you don't actually have an OpenCL device to run your kernels on, it will still be able to compile and run as a standard C++ application. And that'll run on the host device, which is effectively like an emulated OpenCL device. You likely won't get the performance that you'd expect from running a GPU, but it's useful for debugging. So I'm gonna run through quickly uh, an example of, of a Sickle example, application. So this is gonna be a vector add. So the first thing you do is we, we have to include the Sickle header file. So you have a single header file, Sickle.hpp. This includes everything you need to, to use Sickle. Um, and then we're included using the using namespace CL, Sickle to effectively reduce the verbosity of the slides here. The first thing you need is a queue. So in, in Sickle, a queue is used to queue work to a particular device. Um, and here we construct a queue using a GPU selector. So Sickle has this concept called device selectors, which are effectively function objects which describe a heuristic for choosing a device. In this case, the GPU selector is picking a GPU for you. So you pass that to the constructor of a queue. You have a queue that will target a GPU. Obviously, if it can't find a GPU, then it'll fail and throw an exception. In order to submit work to the Sickle runtime and ultimately to the, the GPU, you have to submit what's called a command group. So in Sickle, this idea of a command group is effectively a, a single unit of work that's gonna execute on the device. And this represents the kernel that you're executing as well as all the data dependencies that are associated with it. And the way you construct a command group is by calling this submit function. And that takes a function object with the handler parameter, and that effectively allows you to compose all the different components of your command group. So it allows you to define your kernel, add your data dependencies. And then when that submit finishes, it wraps up into a command group and submits it to the runtime to be scheduled. So in Sickle, we use uh, buffers to represent data. And, then and the way they work is that when you construct a buffer, you give it a pointer to some data and the size of the data. And effectively, you're giving ownership of that data to the Sickle runtime for its lifetime. And what that means is the buffer will manage the data across the host and any number of devices. It also means that when you construct the buffer, initially it does nothing because you've not asked to access it anywhere. So it won't do anything unless you ask for it. And the way you ask for that is through accessors. Um, but one, one quick thing before that is that, so buffers synchronize on destruction using REII. What this means is when the buffer is destroyed, you're releasing ownership of the data. But if there's any work that's running asynchronously on some device, it's, 
needs to write back to that buffer, the destructor will wait for that to finish and then have the data copy back and then it'll destroy. So when your buffer's destroyed, you can be assured that your data is consistent with the, work, with the work being complete. So in order to request access to one of these buffers on, in, a, in a kernel, you create these accessors. And accessors have various parameters that describe exactly how you want to access it. And the, most, the, the one necessary one is the, the access mode that specifies how you, whether you want to read or write. And this is important because it allows the runtime to know how you intend to use it, and it allows it to optimize how they're scheduled and automatically create data dependencies for you. The access is also used inside the kernel when you come to access the data. So you create an accessor and pass it to the kernel. So the last thing is you need to define the kernel itself. So you do this through commands such as this parallel for function. And this parallel for takes a couple of parameters. The first is range. That specifies like, the iteration space that you want to execute across. So in this case, it's the, the number of elements in the vector. And then it takes a function object, which represents the actual device code, like the entry point on the device. And that function takes an ID. An ID effectively represents the index into the iteration space you're executing. So parallel four will result in a kernel that launches um, a number of work items executing the same function and each one will know which, what its position within the iteration space is. One thing you might notice is that the parallel four takes a template parameter. The reason for this is that because C++ doesn't have a standard ABI or standard naming for lambdas, different compilers are not gonna agree about the name of your kernel function. And because Cicl is single source and you can use any standard C++ compiler for the host code, the host compiler may not agree with the naming of the device compiler. So we use this template parameter to name our lambdas effectively. So the device compiler will generate a binary for the for kernel add, and then the runtime will look for the binary called add. So for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna be focusing specifically on this part of the code, the, part, the actual kernels themselves, uh, how to write efficient GPUs, GPU programs and how to optimize them. So I'm, before I do that, I'm going to quickly talk about the Sickle programming model. So the way Sickle programming model works is you have processing elements, which are effectively um, GPU, like GPU threads. Um, and a work, each work item maps to a single processing element. And then you have each work item can also access private memory. So this is private specifically to that work item. So no, a work item can't access the private memory of any other work item specific to that work item. All of the processing elements are then collected together into compute units. And then you have work groups, one or more work groups, executing the processing elements in those work groups. And then each work group can access a special, a specific de dedicated region of memory that's local to the work group. So each work, work, work item can access the local memory of the work group it's inside, but can access the local memory of any other work group. So it's just for sharing between work items in a work group. And when you execute a kernel in SQL, you launch a large number of work items in equally sized work groups, and every work item can access global memory. So you have this hierarchy of memory regions, private, local, and global. And each one of them varies in size and access latency when you're reading from it. So private memory is very small, but very, very fast to access. Local memory is still pretty fast to access. It's a little bigger than it's shared. And global memory is generally, generally very slow to access. And this is usually because it's have to go through an off-chip bus to access. Not necessarily always, but in a lot of cases it is. So, the way the GPU executes these work items, so the GPU generally executes a very large number of work items, generally thousands, but they don't all execute concurrently. A certain number of work items will execute in uniform. This is referred to as lockstep, but the number of work items that are executed in lockstep varies from one GPU to another. For, so AMD GPUs is referred to as the wavefront, NVIDIA GPUs is referred to as the warp. But there's no guarantee as to what that size is from one GPU to another. And there's also no guarantee as to what order these work items will actually execute in. So, so what are GPUs good at? So 
GPUs are, are highly parallel. So GPUs can run a very, very large number of processing elements in parallel. They're also very, very efficient at floating point operations. So GPUs can achieve very, very high flops, floating point operations per second. In fact, flops is generally the measurement that's used to um, evaluate the performance of GPU and algorithms in terms of like a percentage of the peak flops of a particular GPU. And GPUs also have very large bandwidth. They're optimized for throughput, so they're, they're designed to have a lot of data going through them. Okay, so, so next I'm gonna go into uh, explaining some GPU optimizations, and I'm gonna use an example to demonstrate some of them. So there, there are a few different levels at which you can optimize GPU programs. Starting off with effectively choosing the right algorithm. And this means choosing an algorithm that's well suited to parallelism, well suited to a GPU. So a lot of times, so there, there's a lot of performance to be gained simply from porting code to a GPU. But this relies on the fact that that algorithm is well suited to parallelism in the first place. So a good example of this is, say, a sorting algorithm, if you were to do a sort on the GPU. On the CPU, heap sort might be a good choice. That might be very efficient. On the GPU, that would be a very bad choice because it relies on updating the shared state. And when you have a lot of work in trying to update a single shared state, that's going to require a lot of synchronization and it's going to cause problems for, for parallelism. The next thing is, after that, you want to follow some basic GPU programming principles such as coalescing global memory access, using local memory, and I'll, I'll explain these later on. And these kind of generally apply to all GPUs. Beyond that, you have like architecture-specific optimizations. These are things like optimizing for register usage or avoiding bank conflicts on certain GPUs. And these, these are generally specific to maybe certain variations of GPUs or certain vendors. And then further from that, you get micro-optimizations, so things like floating point denorm hacks. These are like bit fiddly optimizations to get the last little bit of performance. But for this talk, we're gonna be focusing on the first two. So choosing the right algorithm and then using some basic GPU programming principles. Towards the end of the talk, I might get into a little bit about some of the kind of architecture specific optimizations, but I'm not gonna go into too much detail. So first of all, choosing the right algorithm. So the first thing to do is to effectively find, figure out what you want to put onto the GPU. And this means looking at your code base, figuring out what areas of your code are, uh, first of all, well suited to parallelism, but also kind of bottlenecks, hotspots that are hit very regularly. And the other thing is when you're deciding what to put onto the GPU and how to optimize it, you want to follow uh, an adaptive optimization approach, some kind of good practice in order to make sure that you're continuing to, to get the best of the optimizations. And one example of this is APOD, which is analyze, parallelize, optimize, and then deploy. And effectively what this means is you first look at your code, figure out what is a good, good code to be optimized, put onto the GPU and parallelized. Then you do the parallelism, you move it to the GPU, you maybe modify the code slightly so that it runs in parallel. And then you can go through some optimizations, try and get the better performance, and then you have to deploy it. And the deploying part is important because when you actually come to use it in production code, you might find that certain use cases don't get the performance you might think, or certain variations or certain inputs might vary in performance. So it's always good to deploy it, get feedback, and then feed that back into the analysis process to then think about how to further optimize. The other thing to be careful of is avoiding over-optimization. So when you're optimizing for the GPU, a lot of some of the early optimizations can yield very large performance improvements. And some of the later optimizations might be a lot of work and might not lead to significant optimization. So sometimes a better approach might be to leave one particular part of the code and go find another bottleneck and now try to move that to the GPU. So sometimes some optimizations might result in diminishing returns, so something to be careful of. So, so what to look for when you're trying to find an algorithm that's well suited to the GPU? So, the first thing is you want it to be naturally data parallel. You want, you want something, a problem where you have the same operation being performed on multiple uh, items at once. Because GPUs, effectively the way GPUs work, they, they load an instruction once and execute it for a large number of items. So they're, they, they're, they work best when performing the same operation on a large number of data elements. You also want the problem to be large enough. So you could have a problem that's highly parallel, 
but maybe only making maybe 100 com computations. And if you have a GPU with thousands of work items, it's not going to be worth it to move your data over to the GPU. You want something with a large data input in order to make it worth it. You also want a problem with independent progress. So little or no dependencies between items in the, in the computation. So this means each work item effectively being able to work independent of others as much as possible. So if you have something where you're requiring constantly to check for partial results from other work items, it introduces a lot of synchronization and then it's going to be less efficient. You also want non-divergent control flow as much as possible. So little or no branching loop divergence. And this comes back to the same idea that GPUs work most efficiently when you have single instruction being executed across a large number of work items. So whenever you have branching control flow or loop, then you have effectively different work items doing different, um, different operations. And then that's not taking advantage of the hardware as, as best it can. So as a motivational example, um, I'm going to look at uh, image convolution. And uh, the reason for this is, so first of all, convolutions are very, very powerful algorithms. So image convolution can be used to adapt to perform a lot of different image processing techniques. And convolutions themselves are also very powerful for other things. So um, convolutional neural networks are the, the basis for machine learning. So it's a very useful algorithm, and it's, it's a very good one for moving, using on, doing the GPU. But one of, one of the things is image convolution is the algorithm itself is embarrassingly parallel. This means that every work item, every item in the computation is completely independent of all the others. And this is perfect for a GPU because they're, you can just, they can all just work on their own item. They don't have to check for results from other ones. The other thing is image convolution is very computational heavy, especially when the filters are quite large. Um, saying that image, the image convolution algorithm is still uh, memory bound. I think most GPU problems are memory bound. Um, but having a, an algorithm where there is a lot of computation makes uh, is more efficient for the GPU. Finally, image processing requires a large bandwidth, particularly if you're doing very high resolution images or perhaps put, uh, processing in, in a, a video feed. We have a lot of images. You have a lot of data, so GPUs are good. Uh, effectively, GPUs are used best when they're kept busy. So the more work you have for them, the the, the more utilization you'll get, the better performance you'll get. So just to very quickly explain the, the convolution, um, image convolution algorithm. So the way convolution works is you have some input matrix of values, and you'll have some filter matrix. So here it's a three by three matrix, but it can be much larger. Effectively what you do is you effectively position the filter matrix over every item in the input, and then the resu corresponding result for that input is the sum of multiplying every itself and every neighboring operation, uh, neighboring element with the corresponding filter. So you multiply them all together and add them. And for image convolution, you, you generally normalize these so that you can keep the same kind of brightness in your images. So this one on screen is a, an approximation of a Gaussian blur. So here's an example of a picture of my dogs. This is blurring the image. Okay, so now I'm gonna go into some basic GPU programming principles that for optimizing this. So the general principle for GPU programming is to maximize throughput. So you want to maximize the amount of compute operations and reduce the amount of time spent on memory operations. So maximizing the compute operations doesn't necessarily mean just having more operations. It means take an advantage of the GPU's hardware. You want to be utilizing all of the GPU's execution elements, and you want to be using those elements to their fullest. And reducing time spent on memory, that doesn't necessarily always mean reducing the number of memory operations. It means reducing the latency of memory operations, which can sometimes mean moving memory to a lower latency region of memory to make the access faster. And I'll cover a lot of these just now. So the first, the first one that I want to cover is uh, avoiding divergent control flow. So effectively, because GPUs work best when you have single instruction across multiple items, whenever you diverge control flow, you have neighboring work items that are executing different items. So given a couple of examples of, of why this is problematic. So here we have eight work items executing lockstep, so they're all executing the same instruction. 
but the code has a condition where it says if the global ID is less than, zero, less than four, do call X, otherwise call Y. So what happens up until the conditional, everything works in lockstep, all the same operations are, are called. But then what's returned from that condition is the first four work items return true, the latter four return false. So then it has to branch. But when GPUs branch, they don't branch off and do separate work. They have the, the, because these ex, uh, work items are executed in lockstep, effectively all you can do is mask off the ones that aren't doing any work. So effectively, and this, the same happens for the other half of the branch, this effectively means that when you branch, you're not reducing the amount of work the work items to do. So effectively, every work item has to do every branch. And if those branches are very large, that's going to be very problematic. And it's, it's important because it's not always obvious that that's what the GPU will do. The other example is loop divergence. So here's a loop, uh, a for loop over the global ID. And for every iteration, it's going to call do something. So here, they all reach the same point in sync. And then they all do the first iteration. But then as the global ID gets larger, they're all going to be doing calling do something many more times. So by the time you get to the the last work, work item of the lockstep is now doing calling it eight times, whereas the first one was only calling it once. So this, this causes a lot of work items just sitting around not doing anything because the work has to be effectively masked out. So bearing that in mind, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through a, a very kind of naive image convolution kernel. Um, so this kernel is uses the parallel four that we saw earlier. Um, and it passes in a global range, which is effectively the size of the image that we're processing in two-dimensional width by height. And then it passes in this ND item, which is kind of like the ID we saw earlier, but it's, it provides further functionality that we'll see later on. And the first thing that we do is we have to calculate, based on this, the, the two-dimensional iteration space, we need to get a linearized position so we can access the memory. So effectively what we do here is we calculate out the size of a row and then multiply that by the global ID zero, and then we, then we add that to global ID one. We have to multiply it by the channels because each position within this iteration space is gonna be working on uh, RGBA um, pixels. So there's gonna be four flow elements. The next thing we do, after we create some, some values for storing the, the, the partial sums, we, we create two nested for loops. They're gonna iterate over the filter. And while it's doing that, it's going to increment the, the index into the filter accessor for accessing those values. And then within that loop, so for each item in the filter, we're going to calculate the offset. It just means multiplying by the number of channels. And then for each of the, the, the channels, RGBA, we're going to do the multiplication of the current item that we're working on multiplied by the corresponding item in the filter and then we're gonna assign that to the, the sum for RGB and A. And then finally, we just, after that for loop is finished, the nested for loops are finished, we assign the sums back to the output. And then when the kernel's finished, you have the result. So here's a, a graph of what the kernel times look like for that kernel. So this is running an image convolution on a 512 by 512 image. This is running on the Intel HD graphics, this is on my development machine. And here we see this, the graph across various convolution sizes. And what we see is the time of the kernel grows exponentially as the convolution size gets larger. And that's because as the convolution is getting bigger, the amount of computation is growing exponentially. So the first thing we can do to optimize this is to make sure that the global memory is coalesced. And coalescing global memory is kind of like the, the low hanging fruit of GPU optimization because it's relatively straightforward to do in most cases, and it can yield a lot of performance gain. So the reason we do this is that reading and writing from global memory is very expensive, because it generally means accessing off-chip off memory. Um, but reading, from, reading and writing from global memory is done in chunks. So, so you'll load a number of elements at once. So this means that accessing data that's physically close together is more efficient. So I'll give an example of this. So here we have some data, uh, an array of floats, and then we create, an, we create a, an accessor to this and we launch a SQL kernel, and inside that kernel, we want to call some function 
that accesses uh, an element of that data um, using the global ID. And if the, the global ID will be a consecutive um, element from zero onwards, and if the GPU is executing those work items consecutively, like if the consecutive processing elements are executed together, correspond to the global ID, consecutive items in the global ID, then these are all just gonna access uh, an element together in the, in the data. Which, and this, so this is coalesced global memory access. So what happens here is you're, we're loading four float elements at once at a time. And because we're using them all, we're getting 100% utilization, which is great, that's what you want. But say instead you strided your, your access, your indexing by multiplying it by two. So you're access, accessing every other element. So here, we're still loading floats four at a time, but you're only using half of them, so you're only getting 50% utilization. So the GPU is doing twice the work it needs to do. And the, the place where this comes in particularly important is when you have a two-dimensional iteration space like we do for the image convolution example that I showed earlier. So here we have some snippet of code that effectively represents the, the, the code we had earlier for calculating the linear ID. And what this is doing is it's getting the global ID 0 and 1, which is effectively the, along the rows and along the columns. And it's mu multiplying the ID 1, which is the, the row, by the stride. And then it's adding that to the current position, the current columns, so the position in the row. And this is called row, row major linearization. And this is, this is how C++ does linearization of, of arrays. So this is what you'd be used to. And if the G, your GPU also executes consecutive work items that are work, uh, executed together in the same linearization method, so they also go along the rows, then you have coalesced global memory access. But what's often the case is that GPUs don't execute in row major, they'll execute in column major, which means consecutive work items being executed are executed down a column, which means you have an access pattern more like this, which effectively means that for every chunk of data you're loading, you're only access, actually using one of them, one element of that, which is very inefficient. So the way to solve this is effectively to switch your kernel to use column major linearization. And here we can do this just by simply switching the, the ID, so it's very straightforward. One thing to note is that in this case, our iteration space is square, so the width and height are the same. So in this case, we can just flip those IDs. If it was rectangular, you would also have to swap the stride to make sure that you're offsetting by the right, the row, the right size of, of, of row. So one thing to note is that the, in SQL, there's no guarantee of how execution, the execution elements are mapped to work items. So generally, in most cases, I've seen that GPUs tend to be column major, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the case. So it's always worth trying both and seeing what the performance is like. So if we go back to our image convolution example, we flip the, the IDs around. So it's now in column major. And then now if we show the kernel times, so this is showing the kernel times as a percentage of the baseline. The baseline is the naive version that we saw before. And it says, and across the board, we're getting more than 50% time reduction, performance increase. So that's, that's a massive improvement simply by switching the pattern you use to access your global, your, your global memory. So the next, next thing is to, to make use of vector operations. So GPUs are, are vector processors. They have a lot of instructions which can do process multiple elements at once, so loading or storing multiple floats at once. So using vectoriz vectorization will give, you, will give you performance. But it is also important to note that a lot of compilers nowadays are very good at auto vectorization. So a lot of GPU compilers, when they compile down to the instruction set for your GPU, will likely be able to look at your code and determine largely what, how to efficiently map the work items to the, the lanes of the, the processing elements. However, you can often still see some performance gain. So this is a very simplified uh, example of what this would mean, but if, without any vectorization, if you wanted to do like a simple add of RGB elements, so you have three, uh, four floats for RGBA for two inputs and then an output, and you have four separate operations where you add each component together. So you end up with four 32-bit floating point adds. Without any vectorization, they're just gonna get executed one after the other. 
but with, with vectorization, whether that be explicit or from the compiler, um, you end up with a 128-bit floating point vector add, which is gonna be much more efficient and make much more efficient use of the GPU's processing element. So the way you do that in Cycle is you use these uh, vector types. So rather than having four float elements, you have a, a sail cycle float four. And then the operation is simply one single add of the float four, and underneath it has vector operations. So if we wanted to change our image convolution to use, make, take advantage of, of the, the vectors, uh, the vector types, first thing we do is outside the kernel, we have to, when we pass the accessor in, you have to pass it in as float type, uh, float four type rather than a float type. This also removes the need to multiply out the number of channels because you know each element of the accessors are representing four channels. Inside the kernel, effectively all you have to do is the, the sum now becomes a single float four and where you had four operations for incrementing the sums and four operations for assigning the sums to the output, you now just have one. So if we look at the, the performance of the kernels with that change, here, this is the kernel times against the baseline. So the green is the baseline, so it's the last version, the coalesced global memory version. And the blue is the new vectorized version. So for a three by three convolution, you can see there's, there's a bit of a performance gain here. We get about 10%. But it seems as the convolution size increases, it kind of logarithmically scales off. So the reason for this is that as the convolution size grows, you're still getting a performance gain from the vectorization. But as the convolution size grows, the amount of global memory access is increasing exponentially, and that's kind of swamping the, the performance you see from the vectorization. So it's still there, it's just, it's a smaller part of the overall time. So it looks a lot smaller. So the last thing is to make use of local memory. So local memory is much lower latency to access than global memory. So you want to cache commonly accessed data into local memory before using it. And also anything that's like, like a temp holding temporary results, you want to put that into local memory so you can share. But using local memory is not necessarily always efficient. So in the case where you have commonly accessed data, it's efficient. But if you're only accessing something once, then you don't necessarily need to put it into local memory. It would actually probably be slower. So looking back at the way the image convolution works to see how would we apply using local memory. So if we think about what each work item is doing, each work item is effectively having to do, when you apply the convolution filter, it's doing an operation per element of the, the convolution. So a three by three filter would be nine operations, five by five would be 25 and so on. So that effectively means every element, every work item is having to do, um, for a three by three filter, nine global loads and for a five by five, 25. So the number of global loads you're doing is growing exponentially. So what you can do is a common technique for using local memory is to tile. So tiling effectively means that your, the, the work items that you execute are grouped up into work items, like uh, work groups, sorry, like we, uh, we saw earlier. And each work group has access to this dedicated local memory. So what we do is we take all of the data that we need to access from global memory, including the, so a border for the edges, and copy that into local memory. And then after that, we access the local memory directly, and that's a lot faster than accessing the global memory every time. So the other thing to consider when using local memory is synchronization. So if, you're, if you have temporary results that you want one work item to modify and another work item to see, you'll want to use synchronization to make sure that, that, that uh, that's done before you access it. Also, if you're doing like what we're doing here and we're copying from global memory into local memory, you want to make sure that all of that copy is done if you're accessing neighboring elements. So for example, you could access a neighboring element and if you don't have any synchronization, that work item might not have reached that point and might not have done the copy yet. And I'll show an example of that just now. So if we go back to the way the work items are executed, so remember that only a certain number of work items are executed concurrently. So if some work items in a work group get to a certain point and they modify some data, that's fine, and then they continue. Let's say after that, they access elements one to the left. Then, because there's no guarantee as to when, what order the work items are executed in, there's no guarantee that that element to the left is actually being updated, so you have a data race. So eventually you need a 
you need synchronization, you need a, a workgroup barrier. So what this workgroup barrier does is effectively when it's reached, every work item in a workgroup has to wait for every other work item to reach the same point before it can continue, which means that it guarantees consistency for the data that you're modifying, so when you continue, there's no data race. One thing to be aware of, though, is that workgroup barriers only apply to workgroups. So if you have an algorithm where you're sharing data via global memory with another workgroup, a workgroup barrier isn't going to make sure that that's done. So GPUs generally don't have workgroup uh, entirely, like um, global barriers, sorry. So the only way to wait for every work item in a kernel to finish is to effectively end the kernel and launch a new kernel. So the way we'd apply this to our image convolution example is, so the first thing we have to do is like we did for the global ID, we want to linearize the local ID, so get the position of local ID within local memory. And outside of the kernel, we, we use an accessor to allocate local memory, and we call that sc scratch pad. So in the same way as you do a global, uh, global accessor buffer, buffer accessor, you can create a local accessor, and then that'll allocate memory per work group, and then that gets passed into the kernel. So once we've got the linear local ID, we can use that and the global ID to then copy from global memory into local memory. Now I've put it in a function here simply to, to keep the slide clean because effectively what it's doing is for every element of in the global ID, it's taking the, the, the element for the global, global ID and copying it into the corresponding element in the local ID. But it also has to copy elements around the border. So there's a little bit of arithmetic in there. So I don't want to keep the slides clean. And after that, the only other change is that here we're now applying the sums, calculating the sums directly from local memory rather than global memory. So all of the loads are going to local memory rather than global memory. Finally, the last thing is you have to insert the bar a barrier after the copy to make sure that all of the, the work items in your work group are done, so all the, the elements are copied into local memory before you start doing computations. So now we look at the performance of the kernel with local memory. So this is, again, this is the uh, kernel time as a percentage of the baseline, where the baseline is the vectorization, vectorized version from before. And you can see there's like a, a general performance gain of about 16, 17%, uh, slightly increasing. But then we get to the 11 by 11 convolution, and then the performance effectively drops, and it's actually worse than before. The reason for this is effectively it's hitting occupancy limitations on the GPU. So effectively, there's a number of things that can limit how much occupancy you can have on the GPU, effectively how much you're utilizing the processing elements you have. So that could be the number of processing elements you have, the number of compute units you can launch, the number of uh, total registers available to a kernel, and the total local memory available to a kernel. So any of these things can limit be a limiting factor that prevents you from utilizing all the, work, uh, the programming elements you can, depending on how your algorithm's written. And you can, you can query all of these things through uh, a get info query function in the Cycle API. So when you, when you get your device that you're running on, you can ask it all of these things. And you can also, once you've compiled your kernel, you can also ask it for the preferred work group size. So that's kind of a way of saying to the GPU driver, now that the kernel's compi compiled, what's the, what would you prefer me to use? And it's not a guarantee that I'll give you the best performance, um, but it's a kind of it's a good hint. Um, a good practice is generally to to try out different workgroup sizes for different inputs and, and see how that goes. You know, there's been there's been various papers about how to choose the best workgroup size for GPU kernels. But going back to um, this this algorithm, this this kernel, and why this is the performance drops. Effectively, what's happening is that the local memory that we were using was an eight, eight by eight. So we had an eight by eight work group size. And eight by eight means you have 64 work items. But the GPU we're running on has 256 pro processing elements to a compute unit, which means you can have work group sizes of up to 256. But that's fine because you can have multiple work groups in the same uh, compute unit executing, and that's fine. However, as convolution size grows, there's a lot of overlap between the tiles. So you have a lot of tiles are accessing the same memory, caching the same local memory, using the same registers as other work items, uh, work groups would do. So what effectively happens is that because there's so much utilization of local memory and registers, you reach a point where 
you hit the limit of how much local memory and registers you have, which means that you can't actually reach the full size of the compute unit. So you hit a limit of you can't have any more work, work groups in your compute unit, which actually means that you hit the limit of how many processing elements you can execute on, which means you're not utilizing all the processing elements anymore. And effectively, that means it's even worse than not gaining performance, you're losing performance because of the way the algorithm's written, you're now preventing a whole bunch of the processing elements from actually doing any work and they're just sitting idle. So the way we can prove this is that we increase the local mem the work group size to 16 by 16. So then you end up with a 256 uh, work item work group, which is actually the, the exact size of the, the compute unit and that fits a lot better. Yep. So, I have a few other uh, optimizations that you can apply. I don't have any code samples for these or, or performance because I want to go through them a bit quicker, but these are some other things that you could try out to do further optimizations. So one is to use constant memory. So most GPUs have uh, a dedicated region of global memory that is read-only. Effectively, that's more efficient to access because it doesn't require caching because you don't ever have to write back to it. So some GPUs have this. I didn't include this in the, the previous examples because the Intel GPU actually doesn't um, perform better with constant memory. Other GPUs do. Another optimization you can use is to use texture memory. So most GPUs have dedicated texture memory. It's used for the render pipeline. So if you have an, uh, an application that's not using the render pipeline and your algorithm is effectively your data is represented as pixels, then that will fit nicely into texture memory. And also means you can take advantage of uh, things like sampling operations, which can do like clamping around the borders and stuff like that. So texture memory would actually be a very good optimization for image convolution. Um, I didn't include this optimization uh, earlier on because it's, it's less, it's not a general optimization in that it is not always gonna be efficient for all applications and for the, image convolution that would be, but it wouldn't apply to all cases. Another optimization is to batch work together. So earlier we looked at uh, hitting occupancy limitations of the GPU, which effectively mean that you have more work groups that you can run at once. So then you end, effectively end up having to launch multiple work groups. But similarly to what we were seeing earlier in that if you have work groups that are effectively caching the same data, if you're launching multiple work groups that are effectively caching the same data every time because they're, they're kind of overlap between them, then it's much more efficient to, instead of doing multiple work groups one after the other, then to make the work group do more work, which effectively means making each work item do more work. So instead of each work item doing a single element, you'd have a work item do multiple elements, maybe four or nine. And because you're, each of those items are kind of working on neighboring items, all the data you need is already there. So you have to load more local memory, but you're making, taking advantage of date memory that's already, data is already cached. Going a bit further than that, if you actually, if you hit the limitation of how much local memory you have, then that's not really an option anymore and you have to do multiple work groups. But effectively what's happening if you have multiple work groups running one after the other, each one of them is loading memory from global to local, and then doing some computation. So you have to wait for the copy to finish before you can do the, the computations. But most GPUs support what's called asynchronous copies, which means running copies asynchronously on the GPU while you're doing something else. So what that means is that if you split your local memory in half and effectively have one, one part doing a copy and one part doing compute, you can overlap them and then reduce the latency there. So you effectively double buffering between two halves of the local memory. And then you, instead of having multiple work groups one after the other, you have a single work group that's just jumping back and forward between tiling one part at a time. Finally, the last one is loop unrolling. So loop unrolling is effectively where you take a loop like the, uh, the, the, the two nested loop over the filter that we had earlier and unroll it into separate statements. And effectively what this does is it gives the compiler more freedom in register allocation and vectorization. So you can get some performance gain from that. The caveat to that is that it increases the obfuscation of your code and it's 
makes a lot, creates a lot of problems for writing general algorithms and flexible algorithms. So, so this, this is the, a loop on rolling for a three by three filter. So you can imagine what it would have to look like for an 11 by 11 filter. So it can increase performance, but there's the caveat that you may end up having to have different kernels for different convolution sizes. Finally, before I wrap up, some, some further tips. So when doing GPU optimizations, um, you, can, you can try out different optimizations and you can see the performance in the kernel times. But a lot of time that might be guesswork as to why, specifically why you're getting that performance gain. So it's always good to profile your kernels. And most GPU vendors provide uh, OpenCL profiling tools that allow you to get access to GPU counters that tell you things like what your global memory utilization is, how much local memory you're using, things like that. And these can kind of give you a better picture of exactly what's happening when you run your kernel. Furthermore, if you, most GPU vendors also provide what are called uh, their, their optimization guides. And these are effectively describe what optimizations are efficient on their particular GPUs. Now, all of the optimizations that I described are kind of general purpose optimizations that you'll get. You'll see performance from most GPUs or all GPUs. But there are certain things that may apply to only specific GPUs or GPUs from a particular class or from a particular vendor. So reading these optimization guides is really good for knowing exactly what the vendors recommend doing or recommend how you tailor your algorithms. Finally, to, to wrap up, um, the takeaways from this talk are effectively, you know, when you're wanting to move code to a GPU, you want to identify which parts of your code base are both well suited to the GPU, to GPU parallelism. And also look for the hotspots, the bottlenecks that will get the most advantage of it. You also want to, um, when you're optimizing GPU programs, you want to optimize for throughput. So you want to maximize the amount of compute operations and minimize the amount of time spent on memory operations. And finally, you want to take advantage of you want to take advantage of profilers and optimization guides to know exactly what's happening in your kernels and to get an idea of what the vendors recommend you do. And that's it. Thank you very much. I think I have about five minutes for questions. If, uh, you can use the, the mic. Um, is there any way I can use the SQL to um, have a more fine-grained control, like C a GPU stream to enable you know, overlap between the CPU computation and GPU kernel? So the question is, is there a way in SQL to overlap CPU and GPU work? Is that the question? Using this uh, GPU stream capability. So overlapping the, the work that the GPU yes. is doing with, with yes. the CPU work. So in SQL, every, all the work that you execute is asynchronous. So when you submit work, it's, it'll happen asynchronously to the host code. So um, you can launch, if you have multiple devices, you can launch work to multiple devices. So if you have a CPU and a GPU, you can use SQL to um, do load balancing and send some work to the GPU and some work to the CPU at the same time. Or you can even use SQL to run work on the GPU and use some other library for the CPU at the same time. So you could have, say, OpenMP doing CPU work and then cycle for the GPU. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. Uh, how does Sickle take a C++ Lambda and compile it into something that'll run on the GPU? So, so the question is, how does Sickle take a C++ Lambda and compile it into something that'll run on the GPU? Um, so it's a good question. So it's, it is largely implementation defined. Um, different implementations may do it differently. But effectively, what it means is device compiler has to identify the, the functions such as parallel four as something that is an entry point for a SQL kernel. And it's, it takes the lambda and effectively has to break it down into a function that can be launched through something like OpenCL. So effectively, all of the accessors, everything you capture in the lambda become the function parameters. And then effectively, it has to break it down to a function, call that function, and then reconstruct it as the user sees it and pass it back on. So there's there's a stage for kind of reconstruction in order to get it back to the way the user sees it. Okay, so is this a separate compiler that runs on top of your code, or? Yes, so you, you, have, your, you have a separate SQL device. So the question is, is it a separate compiler? 
Um, and that's, yes, so you have a separate SQL device compiler that will identify kernels and compile down to okay. uh, some IR or instruct, uh, instruction set. And then you have your regular C++ host compiler that, that generates the actual application. And then that loads in the binary at runtime. All right, thank you. Thanks. Hey, so a best practice you mentioned many times was to uh, profile it on your specific GPU. But if I'm writing a cross-platform application that runs on many devices, what, uh, what tips do you have? So, so the question is, uh, if, you're running, if you're writing an application that's going to run on many different GPUs, um, how best to adapt it? So best practice is if you know the GPUs that are likely to be running it on, um, you want to try and test it on as many different platforms as you can to figure out how they vary. Um, and in some cases, you may want different kernels for different GPUs. So if you have a GPU that can take advantage of particular optimizations, you may want to have a specialization of a kernel that's going to run on one GPU. And you can do that through the SQL API. So if, you, if the SQL API detects that you're running on one GPU, you can launch one kernel. Or if it's a different, different GPU, you could launch a, a different kernel if it's um, going to be more efficient. Um, but generally, you want to try and profile on as many different platforms that you're going to be running on as possible to make sure that you see what's efficient and what's not and adapt the kernel if necessary. Thanks. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, which tools would you recommend for uh, GPU profiling and uh, what metrics uh, are most important? Uh, I also wonder, like you, you were talking about issues that usually very hard to find, like, like you have a, a few working groups working together and they share the same catch. Uh, how to catch these kind of problems in performance? Okay, so the first first question is is which profilers to I would recommend. Um, so catch I can't remember the, the exact names off the top of my head, but I know Intel has a, an OpenCL profiler. Um, Nvidia also has a, an OpenCL profiler. I believe AMD used used to use CodeXL, but I think that's been discontinued. I'm not entirely sure what the replacement is. Um, but I'm sure there will be one if you look at their their website. Um, so I, I didn't quite catch the second question. Could you repeat that? Uh, the second question is uh, issue that you were talking about the performance. Uh, sometimes th th this stuff is very hard to catch. Like when you have few working groups and they share the same catch and it leads to the performance degradation, how would you recommend uh, like di diagnose these kind of issues? So th the question is how to how would you recommend kind of diagnosing what the problem is when you see performance drops. I, th I think after a while, you would kind of develop a kind of intuition as to what might be causing it and the kind of common problems. But initially, I think the best thing to do is to use profilers, um, because a lot of profilers will provide specific um, counters that will um, tell you details about what's happening. Um, initially, something that might be, it's kind of a bit difficult to understand exactly what all the counters mean. But usually, most of the tools come with good documentation that will explain how to use them. Um, but profiling is, is the best way to, to begin with. Thanks. Uh, hello. I would like to ask about uh, interoperability with uh, native code, let's say, with CUDA code, or with uh, CUDA-specific libraries like Kublas. Is so it possible? So the question is, can you can Sickle interoperate with um, existing libraries for something like CUDA or Kublas? Is Correct. that right? So, so it's a good question, actually. So um, Sickle, Sickle does have a lot of the equivalent libraries to things like Kublas, so there's things like Sickle Blast, and there's a lot of open, open source projects for these kind of things. Although, obviously, Sickle is a lot younger a standard than, the, than things like CUDA, so these things are still in development. Um, in terms of supporting existing libraries from other programming models, I don't think you'd be able to use something like Kublas directly in Sickle. But Sickle does have uh, interoperability, where you can call um, functions defined in other libraries as long as the binary representation matches. So for example, you could have a Sickle application that calls uh, some library functions. And the way you do it is you just declare them as X and C functions. Um, and then what you can do is at runtime, you can link that together with some other library, uh, whether it be source or binary. Um, and then if that provides, as long as that compiles fine, as long as they're compatible and they compile, uh, 
and that library has that function, then you can execute it. So you could do something like uh, if you had a SQL implementation that compiled, device compiler compiled down to PTX, and then you had some PTX library in PTX format, then at runtime you could link that library in and execute it. So as uh, long as the binary format's matched, then, uh, then that's fine. Is it, is it possible to synchronize on two different, uh, two different kernel, kernels? One is SIG, uh, generated by SQL, and the other generated by, uh, well, let's say Kublas, uh, and executed from different streams. So if, if I understand the question, is a question, can you have, say, kernels running on something like CUDA or Kublas, um, and kernels running through SQL and have them kind of synchronize with each other? Yep. So the way you do that in, in SQL is um, there is a way to get events from SQL command groups. So you could launch work through a command group in SQL, and then you can have events that can wait on that. Um, and then you could write some C++ code that would provide uh, either like callbacks or signals that will trigger work from some other API. Um, there, there, there is a proposal for an extension to SQL that will make that easier, where you can have effectively native tasks running in the SQL scheduler, which is basically just a regular C++ thread running with the same scheduling. So what you could do is you could have SQL kernels running and then have some host task that will call out to some other API, and then uh, you could go back to SQL tasks. So it's possible, but there's extensions coming that propose that will make it a bit easier. Thank you. Thanks. GPUs were created to do graphics, and we just happen to be using them now for computation. Are you aware of any, aware of any products that are really specialized for computation? Is that on the horizon? So it's a good question. So the question is, is there any GPUs or products that are designed specifically for these computations? So GPUs, so it's, it was kind of an accident that it was found that GPUs were very efficient for computations like this. And it's been working really, really well for some problems. Um, but there are some devices that have been coming out uh, recently. So there's been a lot of uh, vision processors that have come out that are tailored specifically for doing image processing or like video processing. Um, there's a lot of new tensor processors now that are designed specifically for doing like convolution neural networks for machine learning. Um, a lot of these are very kind of early days. There's a lot of startup companies um, developing these kind of uh, these type Does of Does SQL support any of these? Um, currently, no. there, so the way the current implementations of SQL are there's the code play implementation, compute CPP. And that will support anything that has SPEAR-V. So if these devices support uh, OpenCell and SPEAR-V, then they'll work. Um, other SQL implementations could be implemented to support any platform, um, yeah. even without SPEAR-V. Um, Compute CPP supports most kind of desktop CPUs and GPUs. Um, the, the other device that it currently supports is the, the Renesis CV engines, uh, which is the effectively their um, it's kind of purpose-built processor for uh, running in cars for automotive. Um, currently, Compute CPU doesn't uh, support any specific like tensor processors, but there's, there will Thank likely you. be SQL implementations in the future that can. Would you potentially have a performance gain uh, instead of doing the 2D convolution with one kernel, having like a horizontal kernel, and then once that's complete, run a vertical convolution kernel? So the question is, could you have a performance gain by doing um, like horizontal convolutions instead of uh, the, the full square run? Um, there's potentially, yeah. I could, I could see how that could, I could probably, I'd have to try that out. Um, I've not tried that personally. Um, but maybe some of my colleagues have. Oh, thanks. thanks. Does SQL support uh, standard library? Uh, sorry, could you repeat? Uh, does SQL support standard library? Ah, so good question. So the question is, does SQL support standard library? So you mean inside kernel functions? Yeah. So um, by, this, by this, this SQL standard, it doesn't support um, like arbitrary C++ code, but there are SQL equivalents to most standard library, like math functions and things like that. Um, generally, this limitation comes from limitations on GPU hardware. So for example, GPU, there are certain things that GPUs can't do. So GPUs can't do dynamic allocation on the, on the GPU, uh, can't, often can't do recursion or function pointers or virtual function calls. So 
these limitations generally to why um, standard library functions won't necessarily work. There are some standard library functions that ha just happen to work because they don't run into any of these problems, but the standard doesn't require it. Usually you have other libraries that would kind of uh, provide a suitable replacement for the standard library. Thank you. Thanks. I think that's all the questions. Thank you.